So hi, everybody. Um, who of you has heard of the Things Network? That's uh, pretty good. Um, so yeah, my name is Jorn Stocking. I am uh, uh, the co-founder and technical lead of the Things Network. And I'm going to tell you something uh, first about our idea, uh, what we do, but very briefly. And then I will dive into uh, some technical aspects. Um, it all started with uh, last year in June um, when the LoRa 1 specifications uh, uh, became public uh, just a few months before. And um, uh, LoRa is a modulation that is designed for uh, the Internet of Things. Because um, as you probably all know, um, in most things there is no Internet uh, if you define Internet as being the IP stack. So although you have a lot of starter kits with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and everything, um, that's all very great. But most things uh, are very low power uh, and um, uh, then Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and uh, things like that are way too heavy. So LoRa is, the, is a modulation. It's designed for the Internet of Things. There's a LoRa alliance um, consisting of operators, uh, IoT industry partners, and we are also a member of it. And one of the things with LoRa is it's a radio protocol. Uh, and if you set up a, a gateway, it's like a, a hotspot. It can serve 10,000 of nodes, uh, depending on the behavior of the nodes. So if they send a lot of data, then your capacity decreases. Um, because it's low power and because you can only send very small messages, um, you can uh, make really low power solutions that run on solar panels or on batteries or both. Um, uh, that are autonomous, that you don't have to recharge um, uh, for months or for years. It uses the unlicensed spectrum. Um, so if you look at the world everywhere, almost everywhere, there are the so-called, uh, in Europe, for example, the ISM bands. Um, it's around 868 megahertz. Uh, US, it's 915. And the LoRa Alliance is currently in the progress of um, uh, certifying and, and specifying the frequency plans also for other countries. So um, I think eventually uh, a lot of, there will be many frequency plans, but it all will be the same technology. So you can um, use LoRa almost everywhere in the world. Uh, and you don't need to have a license to use this spectrum. So if you look at LoRa, the way it works is um, there is a, yeah, there is so-called narrowband in, in, in um, for example, LoRa, it's not uh, narrowband, it's uh, so-called spread spectrum. So what you see in the left, uh, there's communication below the noise level. Uh, instead of um, putting uh, a lot of power on a specific frequency. And on the right, you see a um, spectrum analysis where you see the, uh, the, yeah, the symbols uh, of uh, a LoRa packet um, that are changing frequencies slightly. If you compare it to other wireless solutions, um, LoRa is really in the long range in cities between 500 meters a kilometer up to three, four kilometers, and outside cities 10, 15 kilometers. It really depends on what is between your gateway and your device. Um, but it's low bandwidth, so um, it's not able to, you know, for Netflix or something, that's, that's not gonna be possible. I will address this a bit later. Um, so, um, um, yeah, basically with this technology, we, um, we formulated our mission already quite soon in, in June. Uh, and our mission is to build a decentralized, open and crowdsourced Internet of Things data network that is owned and operated by its users. Uh, because this is now possible. Everybody can buy a gateway, set it up, uh, connect it to the cloud, and then uh, create one big network together. You don't need a commercial telecom operator to do that for you. And we wanted to validate this mission um, quickly. So we went to the IoT meetup in Amsterdam uh, in July. And my co-founder, Winke, uh, presented this idea. And uh, we, we were like, uh, yeah, what, what do you think? Is this a good idea? Uh, do you want to join us? And um, uh, yeah, a group of people already um, were, were quite uh, enthusiastic about the idea. And um, uh, while Winke called uh, companies that we used to work for or companies that we knew that were probably interested in, uh, in an initiative like this, um, these are the, the, the first partners that we, that we had on board. I was um, uh, building the backend in, uh, in Go. Uh, it's a programming language uh, f designed for microservices. It's not very well known, but um, uh, Docker, for example, is built in Go. Um, and it's also open source. And um, so we, we built, we, yeah, 
we built the technology, we tried to prove it, whether it worked, but also uh, worked already from the start with uh, the community and businesses to develop the network. Um, I built uh, the first backend, so we had a project, uh, it's called uh, Laura Croft. It was um, <laughs> one of the brilliant ideas in, uh, when you have some beer. And this was our first use case, um, a boat sensor in Amsterdam. So it already gave some idea, you know, this is, this is what you can do, for example, with very little data. You, only, you, you don't send anything unless you see water. But if you want to send a message, then you need long-range, low-power communication. You don't need to have any handshaking things, handover, whatever, with a network. It's just sending a message, hey, there's water, uh, and you get a text message. So, so that, that was the first, um, the first idea. Um, then we did a Kickstarter campaign to make the hardware a little bit more affordable. And I understood that Triple IT is sponsoring um, uh, 75 development kits. That's the ones you see on the top right. And um, there will be some kind of game, competition, whatever, to hand them out to you. And um, these you can use to, uh, it's, it's an Arduino compatible board, and you can use them to, uh, to communicate and develop your first use case on a LoRa network. Doesn't have to be necessarily the things network you can do, it also works on a KPN network. This is the, um, the gateway, we, are, uh, we have a bit of delays. Um, we expect shipping in November uh, because of multiple reasons. It's a complex product, but it's, um, we have all the pieces of the puzzle together. And, working on the firmware today and the distribution. Um, so how it works is that you have uh, gateways and they have um, their reach and you have nodes and they are in reach of one or two or five or 10 gateways. Uh, the gateways are connected to cloud services. Um, that is the things network, uh, could be a private network, could be the public community network. Um, and this is like a star of stars network where eventually your data ends up uh, in the user application. Uh, we deploy the um, pu public community network um, uh, globally and um, we have a, yeah, a kind of a sponsorship with uh, Microsoft currently, but uh, yeah, it's uh, the initiative I heard before. It's, it's also uh, really interesting, also would uh, be very applicable to our initiative. Um, it's de decentralized, de distributed, so um, we are also working with infrastructure providers that set up part of the network themselves and connect to the public community network so you, can, it's, you, you don't rely on the infrastructure that we run. So how it works basically is that you have gateways, they um, communicate with uh, routers, and routers they uh, use um, uh, network service discovery to find uh, brokers and brokers um, have so-called handlers, application handlers registered, and the handler uh, works on behalf of the application. So the trust comes both from the left, where the gateway, gateway owner configures a specific router, so public community router or private network uh, in the gateway, uh, and the application developer uh, has a handler, and the handler is registered on a broker of choice, and between them there is a network service discovery. You can also set up your private network. So this is, for example, your own stack. Uh, it's all open source. You can connect your own gateways, um, but you can also connect your private network to the public community network. Uh, so you, you own the infrastructure, you control the infrastructure and your flow of data, uh, but you can also use the uh, coverage of the public community network as a fallback for your own network, and at the same time, you contribute back. Different ways to get data from the, um, from the network. Um, uh, we have um, uh, integrations with IoT platforms, that is, I think, what most application developers will use, but you can also get it a bit lower level, just MQTT messages. Um, we decided not to build our own um, Internet of Things cloud platform, because there are many already, uh, and um, we don't want to force developers in a specific uh, direction. So we built integrations with, um, with the bigger IoT platforms, but this is also uh, something where community members can contribute to uh, in an open source manner. Um, because the, the project, the routing services are open source. And we believe that uh, doing this open source is the only way to make it big. Um, I think um, if you have a zero threshold, so zero costs, and it's transparent, uh, everybody can see what you're doing, can extend it, can uh, adapt it to their needs, uh, maybe contribute back to the, to the open source project. 
Um, but at the same time, it's also, uh, you can create a platform, that's also what we are doing, but you can do that yourself as well, where uh, businesses can uh, create value. And that is eventually um, what should make the Things Network a sustainable initiative. So um, one, of the, one of the key things that we have in our community is, uh, is a forum. We have, we have uh, thousands of members in our community, uh, so we have the most active LoRa forum in the world. Uh, we have the Things Network Labs. This is where you can share ideas and projects and, and getting started and uh, all kinds of content you can, you can contribute to and find uh, documentation uh, from people from all over the world. Uh, we have community pages. Uh, the, the thing that we started in Amsterdam uh, has been uh, copied by uh, more than 250 communities. So um, uh, you can find on the map a community that you have nearby. Uh, this is, for example, Zurich. They have uh, 50 gateways. And um, um, this is our dashboard. It's, um, it's, uh, it looks a bit better uh, now. But you can see your, your data flowing in and see everything uh, if it's working. Uh, but again, this is all very small packets. Um, so yeah, so the communities, uh, what we started in Amsterdam has been copied by uh, communities, other communities all around the world, and um, every community has an uh, initiator, and this is currently uh, an image of, the, of where all these uh, 250 communities are, so a lot of them are in Europe. Um, I think also what I, what I see when I talk with um, other people, technology providers that are in IoT, they say that Europe is is kind of ahead of the US currently when it comes to uh, deployment. Um, uh, I don't know really what the reason is for that. Uh, I think in LoRa it's a bit skewed also because LoRa is originally uh, from Europe uh, and there are, are some European um, operators that already committed quite early to deploy a, a national network uh, such as KPN, Proximus and Orange. Uh, we have um, the communities, they all have an initiator and they, they have a face, they are usually um, well-connected people in, in a specific city or area and um, uh, they, they know their way, they know the challenges in those regions and uh, they form a community around them so they, they are an autonomous group but we provide them with technology and, and documentation from, from here from Amsterdam where we are based. So the way to deploy the network is, um, yeah, you can deploy the network uh, whatever you need. So uh, do you need a lot of gateways? Do you need um, uh, specific coverage somewhere? Uh, you, you can do that. Uh, that's also something that you have to do because uh, we don't do it for you. Um, you can also choose the level of security that you need. So you can use the, the public network to encrypt and decrypt your data, but you can also uh, do that yourself. Uh, and you can add capacity where you need it. So when it comes to routing services or uh, gateway capacity is, you know, if you have um, uh, an application with uh, thousands of nodes in a specific region, uh, then it's probably um, feasible to add another gateway there. Um, so we have four models. First is the public community model, um, where you uh, trust the public community network that is run by the Things Network Foundation. Um, to encrypt and decrypt your data. And uh, this is much like uh, trusting uh, Amazon to, to do your HTTPS encryption, for example. You, you trust uh, another party with your private key. Um, what you can also do is um, uh, have the uh, private key on your own domain. And this is where you run the application handler on your own machine. Um, and, um, and this is where you get the end-to-end -end encryption that is, um, that is enabled by, uh, by LoRa. Uh, you can also uh, have your, uh, your own uh, gateways, uh, so this is where you have your own infrastructure uh, next to um, the public community network that acts much like as a fallback uh, for, your, for your own services, uh, but you can also have your own private network that is not connected to anything, and this is much like, um, uh, like a Wi-Fi that you have at home, uh, where you only use it for your own use. Um, and this is, uh, this is usable in, in places where, for example, you don't even have internet, uh, or where you are on an oil rig or something, whatever use cases uh, there might be. Um, so a bit deeper into LoRaWAN. Uh, LoRaWAN is a uh, software protocol uh, that is on top of uh, LoRa modulation. Uh, not necessarily, but it, um, it uh, fits very well together. LoRaWAN is specified by the LoRa Alliance. And there are three classes of devices. The first one, uh, class A, uh, is where communication is always initiated from the uh, device. 
So this is um, usually like uplink only, but every time that the device sends a message, the network has the opportunity to send the message back. So this is um, uh, yeah, two-way communication, uh, but you always have to wait for the device to send you something. Class B is where the network and the device um, set up like a, a synchronization uh, interval together so that um, there is uh, every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes uh, a window to send uh, data back to, um, uh, to the node. Uh, this is also still low power and then class C is where the device is continuously listening uh, and as you can imagine this is not really the most uh, low power way uh, to communicate but still um, for also for temporary use might be very interesting to have this and if you control lightning for example uh, then yeah by definition to to turn on the light there should be power anyway um, so this might be um, a use case for for class C um, what we usually see in our community today and it's also because of the lack of specification uh, is um, is class A uh, communication and the way that works is that the the node initiates um, sending of a message, an uplink message, uh, sends it to all the gateways uh, that are in reach. Um, so um, because it's a radio protocol, uh, you have gateways also from different operators, they all receive your message. And um, they, will, um, yeah, they will find out whether they can uh, decrypt the message, uh, whether the message is intended for this network in the first place. Um, maybe there is roaming between the networks, that's also what is being worked on by the LoRa Alliance. Um, but then the device sets up, uh, goes to sleep, and one second later uh, it comes back from sleep. This is, by the way, a tweakable value, but after a number of seconds it wakes up again and it starts listening uh, to see if the network wants to send something back. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it wakes up one second later uh, to see if it maybe then wants to send something back, and if not, it goes back to sleep. So this is the, like two windows to send data back uh, to, uh, to the network. Um, when it comes to security, uh, one thing to remember is that uh, LoRa is very low power and low cost, and usually one of the uh, uh, cheapest ways to, um, to attack a specific application is just to physically uh, attack the sensors or the end devices. If you want to do it for more from a software side, um, there, are, there is a, um, like I said, there is end-to-end -end encryption uh, between the device and the user application, so the network doesn't have to, to be able to decrypt the, uh, the application payload. Um, there is a shared key, it's the, uh, the app key, um, which is actually a, a specific key per device, and um, from that per session there is a key derivation uh, there are two keys, two session keys. Uh, one is for the network, so that is what the Things Network has to know to route the data, and the other one is for the application payload. And these are 128-bit uh, AES keys, uh, which is pretty strong encryption for Internet of Things um, applications. So two ways to uh, provision devices. One is where uh, there is a new session every time the device activates itself, and the, which is much like um, a dynamic IP address, for example, and the other one is uh, where you program the session keys in the device, so you have like a permanent session, um, and um, this is much like a static IP, so it always has the same address, uh, and the yeah, the, it has both has advantages, disadvantages. It's not really one is better than the other, but these are two different options depending on the scenario. So if you have um, yeah, the security model, the device, the application, uh, in this case the network, the things network, um, the device wants to join the network and um, it sends it to the application, a join accept, there is a key generated, the network session key, and uh, the, the network gets the network session key, the device as well. Um, but the application session key um, is um, calculated on both sides, so it's by calculated on the device side and on the application side and they generate the same key based on some random values. Um, and the application session key is used to, uh, to um, uh, encrypt the application payload. So if you put the box around it, this is essentially what the network is, um, then you have end-to-end -end encryption uh, uh, in the bottom. Um, so uh, yeah, limitations. Um, it's very limited actually, uh, but it also gives a lot of uh, new opportunities for new use cases. Um, there are actually two, um, 
uh, things you can set, you can change the data rate, that's uh, how fast data is being sent on the network. Uh, but if you send with a higher data rate, then uh, you decrease the chances that your uh, message arrives. So this is like a, a trade-off. And there is a mechanism in LoRa 1, it's called adaptive data rate, to automatically, like the network controls the data rate of individual devices. And you have the payload size, that is how much data do you send, and together that is the airtime. And to make it all scalable and everything, uh, we set the airtime to 30 seconds per day. Uh, so you have um, uh, yeah, two tweaks. You have the data rate, which you can set, but uh, ideally you use uh, adaptive data rate. And you have the payload size. And this is actually the thing that you can control. Uh, so you don't send JSON or XML or anything like that. So this is an example. Um, if you have uh, what, we see, what we actually saw happening on our network in the beginning was that people were sending JSON messages from the device. Uh, and yeah, if you're only interested in this case only in the temperature, then you can, you know, if, if you really want to send JSON, then you can make it a little bit more compact. Uh, but you can also send it as a, as a value still, string representation or a two byte integer. So if you look at 51 bytes, like a big weather station, including GPS, humidity, wind direction, temperature, everything, um, usually you need like 20, 25 bytes. And I think for most use cases, it's, it's more like one byte. Hey, there happened something on this port. This is my event. Uh, so you can do a lot of powerful things with very little data. One of the things that we are working on as well is um, the sensor fleet. And this is um, using uh, downlink, so using 51 bytes of downlink messages to the device to be able to control them and to change their behavior. So if you have, for example, a device on the, the, on the top left, this could be the, the Things Uno um, device, or our development board. You can uh, have sensors connected to it or GPS or whatever. Uh, it has a radio module, so in this case it's LoRa 1, but you can also have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and you can have three connections at the same time, and then you know, have a library that chooses whatever is uh, connected or whatever is uh, available. Um, uh, you have the network, and then um, on top of that you have some more uh, infrastructure. And I don't know if this is any readable, it's going to be very quick. Um, you, can, you can provision a device and say, hey, this is, you have uh, this sensor, this type on that port, and this is temperature, and give me it every, every hour or when it changes every 15% uh, change limit, something like that, it's very small instruction. Uh, this would be encoded as a very small message um, to the network, and then the device would program itself uh, to accommodate this change. And um, uh, as long as you think very wisely about what you do with your 51 bytes, you, you can do a lot of things, actually. And that is, um, that is, that is pretty cool to, uh, to see uh, working. So, um, yeah, if you look at use cases, um, you have the usual suspects, uh, the parking sensors, uh, and smart trash cans, and air qualities in buildings. It's, it's very good. It works. Uh, it's, these are very suitable use cases for, uh, for LoRaWAN. Um, but this technology also enables real innovation. And um, because this is like, yeah, moving forward, looking backwards, so like the, the, the first car was like a carriage without a horse, and it's like just changing the way of communication uh, from Wi-Fi or from 3G or 4G to uh, LoRa. Um, but yeah, like real innovation is, for example, um, this, uh, Safecast, it's a project in Japan, and uh, they are prototyping with um, uh, the Things Network technology. Uh, what they currently do, this is um, uh, after the, the Fukushima meltdown in 2011. They, um, the Japanese government wasn't very open with sharing information, uh, what was really going on. So um, uh, the people, uh, like a community project started and they started to measure the radiation with a device like this. And it writes the radiation levels and the GPS position to um, uh, to, uh, to an SD card, and then somebody has to read the SD card and, and plot it on the map. So if you look at the map, you see the, um, you see the roads, and they use some interpolation to, uh, to make the nice uh, colors uh, in there. And this is where you see the cloud of radiation because of the wind that came inland. Um, this is a very, use, very applicable use case for the Things Network because you can just uh, put a LoRa antenna in here and, uh, and, and drop these devices, um, having them measuring continuously or uh, mounting them on, uh, on, on something that moves to, to go into an area that is, for example, has just been 
um, affected by, uh, by a lot of radiation. And because it's low power and very easy and simple to set up, th these are use cases that are, that are uh, very uh, suitable for the Things Network. Another one is very simple, uh, water level sensors. It's, it's like uh, 30 euro equipment um, uh, and uh, you, can, um, you can measure the water levels. But the, the, yeah, what is really interesting is to combine this information and make a map and then see around the city, this is one of our community projects, uh, what the water levels are and if there's any uh, warnings and where it came from and which river is higher and whatever and things like that. So th these are sample use cases. Um, yeah, so that is our mission, that is, that is what we do. And um, um, yeah, what we also do is uh, workshops. And um, this is where, uh, this is by the way, something that you can build with the things you know, uh, just as an idea. It's a parking um, a sensor and it works uh, the way it should work. So it works with a magnetic um, field uh, sensor uh, to, um, to see if there's a car uh, underneath. And um, one of these examples is, um, this is also, by the way, a binary value that you send, whether there's a car or not. And it depends on the time that the message has been sent. You can see what the occupation is of uh, parking uh, spots. Um, but this has been built without any coding. So this is using drag and drop IoT interfaces. Um, and, um, and that makes it also very, um, uh, yeah, like a, a very low threshold for people to get started. So um, yeah, that's the Things Network. Um, I think I have um, eight minutes for questions. So um, happy to uh, give some answers to questions that you may have. Wow. Any support for 4K video streaming on the roadmap? No, not yet, no. Christian. Christian Otto, Computest. Thanks, Johan. Uh, very interesting uh, to hear about LoRa. Uh, I was wondering, if you have 51 bytes of payload, how do you handle authentication and max and stuff like that within that space? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> um, the uh, 51 bytes of payload is encrypted. And uh, it, there is um, uh, two bytes of, uh, it's called the message integrity check, uh, is appended to the, to the, to the entire frame. And um, the network can, uh, it's like a CRC, so the network can see if it can generate the same two bytes uh, based on the security key that, that the network thinks uh, that the device has. So if those match, uh, then, um, so it's like a very simple CRC check, uh, then the network can determine whether this message is, is indeed from the device. Uh, the application payload is encrypted, so the application, we just pass the encrypted payload to the application and the application will decrypt it with the session key. So, apart from the fact that 16 bits is a bit uh, short, I mean, we learned that from DNS. Yeah. Um, you could just repeat those messages. And no, um, there is, so there is a four byte device address, also part of the entire frame. Um, and four bytes, as you all know, uh, IPv4, it's very limited address space, especially for IoT. Um, but um, um, actually, that, those four bytes combined with uh, the two uh, bytes for the message integrity check, they can, they, uh, like, uh, yeah, ch checking if you have the, the same two bytes and this device address, mm -hmm. that is essentially, uh, being yeah, almost certain that it comes from this specific device. Um, to is there, is avoid there a time component? Oh, sorry? sorry? Yeah. Is to there avoid a, a replay attack, um, there is also a frame counter, which is also part of the entire message, so uh, besides the payload. Uh, and that is what the network uses to uh, avoid a replay of the same message. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Maybe well, you two hackers should look at the source code and do a small audit. So either the story was super clear or you guys don't give anything. It's, uh, it's always a good conclusion, one of the two. I, I thought it was very clear. Thanks. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, we, we are with a team of uh, 15 uh, and we are based in, uh, here in Amsterdam. We have a few people working uh, remote and um, uh, it's, it's um, for us, we, we are, I also have a more like a cloud services uh, application development background. So for me, all the IoT stuff is quite new. 
Uh, and at first, um, you think, yeah, what, what can you do with 51 bytes uh, and only having uh, like 20 or 50 messages per day? Uh, but you can see a lot of interesting use cases uh, coming up. And um, also the way we design the network and also the government's model that we want to move to, uh, because currently we have the Things Network Foundation running the public community network, but we want to decentralize everything. Uh, so not only the infrastructure, but also, for example, uh, compensations that we may have on the network in the future. So um, uh, we have um, uh, two parties that uh, add value to the network. So gateway owners, for example, they add coverage and they keep the gateways connected, they keep them uh, online. Uh, and we have routing service providers, so those are the parties that, that, that run uh, the servers. Uh, and on the other end, we have application developers that take value from the network by, by using the network and by routing packets. And we, wanna, we are currently working on how, to, how can we um, uh, compensate uh, these, this value exchange that happens on top of a decentralized network um, and um, what technologies are there. So we are looking at, for example, uh, a blockchain uh, to have uh, like transactions on top of the network between, uh, anonymously between application developers and gateway owners. Uh, so gateway owners also have an incentive to install uh, gateways. And um, well, yeah, so you guys are all technical network people, um, but I'm also uh, very interested in hearing your thoughts. So if you have any ideas on this or if you want to contribute in any way, then uh, feel free to reach out. This community has a, a long, uh, rich history of uh, sharing a limited resource and entire working groups are dedicated to that. Uh, in, for instance, the uh, RIPE, who manage IP space and it is a tricky, tricky <laughs> topic yeah. to make sure that you distribute resources in a fair way. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, I, I have one more question. Uh, you showed a picture that, that showed that Amsterdam is, is uh, covered. Uh, you mentioned a use case like smart uh, garbage bins. In, in uh, what kind of timeline are we looking at that in Amsterdam there will actually be smart garbage bins? Is, is the local government working on that today, or, or is it more an idea? Or? Um, so we are ourselves not really into the use cases, um, but what we see is that there are indeed a lot of companies, integrators working on this, but I think this is all, yeah, this is going to take a while still. Um, so there's always a chicken and egg problem. What, what do you start with, with the use case or with, uh, with the network uh, in this case? And we thought, yeah, just Let's uh, deploy the network and see what happens. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we welcome all the initiatives and all use cases that are being deployed on our network. Um, but um, yeah, for us, it's, it's like really a network first uh, approach. And uh, which is, uh, yeah, waiting, also waiting for, for, for big use cases. But I think these smart city, yeah, it's, those are not, for me, not the most appealing use cases, but um, we, yeah, we are, we are also, for example, we are working on a use case with the Port of Amsterdam. It's one of the very few use cases that we do ourselves with the Port of Amsterdam on um, uh, um, uh, like, um, uh, detecting trucks in, in the port that come to pick up stuff from, uh, the, from ships. Uh, and the ships, they, they have been uh, on, the, on the water for, uh, for a few weeks probably. And, um, and there's a, always a big mismatch between trucks and ships when they have to uh, uh, exchange the load. And um, uh, this is something that we start measuring and that also gives some insight and stuff. And the, these are real use cases that are being deployed uh, in the short term. Yeah. Cool. Jan Bietmans, uh, what about garbage cans outside of the Netherlands? Or rather, Laura outside of the Netherlands? Yeah, so actually um, for us, uh, for me personally, I find um, use cases in, not in Western world cities the most interesting. If you look at a lot of startups, they, they focus on 1% of the world, which is uh, cities in the US or cities in Europe. Uh, but LoRa, because it's so cheap and long range, you can do so many things that are uh, very remote. So you can, you, can, uh, you can have farmers that get insight in, in, uh, in their, um, in their in their land, for example. Um, so I think currently it's, it's kind of natural that uh, a lot of use cases are developed in, in cities and um, we have a very strong community in the Netherlands, but there are, yeah, I think we, we get two thirds of, of, the, of the activity or three quarters of the activity currently uh, in our community from outside the Netherlands. 
Um, and it's all the things network. So, and it's, there is, there is no roaming in the sense that there is no, it's, it's one big network uh, that, that is connected. So solutions that you build here, they also work uh, somewhere else. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Yeah.